I've got a new toy. If you remember last week in the video when I tried to do Star Trails where I didn't have the clear knives that I wanted, I mentioned I've got a new piece of gear coming that will help with the composition. That's what it is. So let's get this box open and let's see what we've got today. So this is Canon's 15 to 35 IS USM F2.8 RF mount lens. And I'm very excited that I've got it. One, because it's F2.8. I was considering the F4 instead of the F2.8 purely for price differences, but I've got this one instead because if I want to do something like Star Trails like I was doing last week, this will definitely be a much better lens to use than an F4. Also, there's many times when I'm out there taking photos and I often wish I could go wider instead of zooming in more. So that's why it made more sense to get this lens over a 70 to 200 or a 100 to 400 in comparison first. Those lenses may come later on, we'll see. But let's get this on the camera first because I'm eager to get out and use it. That's a chunker of a lens that is significantly bigger and heavier than my 24 to 105 f4. But at the same time, it is an f2.8, so you do expect it to be a bit heavier by default. But let's stop talking. Let's go get the camera bag ready. Let's go test out this lens at all the focal lengths and all the apertures. I want to see exactly how it is. I'm not fussed about conditions, even though it's meant to be raining, but I'm still going to go anyway. It's a week later now. I did take this lens out to Bradley's head and finished off the night at the Harbor Bridge to take some test pictures with it. If you want to see all the pictures and videos from that day, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out. But let's take a look at some test pictures I made when I was there at different apertures and focal lengths. And to make sure this video doesn't drag on for too long, we're just going to look at the pictures I took at f2.8 and f11. I deliberately didn't go any narrower than f11 to like f13 or f16 or something, because at that point you start risking diffraction in your images, which will soften it out because your aperture is too small or the lens opening is too small as well, I should say. And I didn't want to risk ruining the images in that way. I wanted to get crystal clear images. So that's why I deliberately didn't stop down any lower than F11. That way we can see a relatively decent depth of field without the risk of diffraction in the image as well. And in all of these images, I focused on the center of the frame, which is relatively in the middle for the foreground and the background. And I did that on purpose because that way you can see exactly what sort of depth of field and how much is in focus at different apertures and at different focal lengths as well. So that way you have an idea of exactly what it is you're gonna get if you go out and buy this lens for yourself and start using it as well. So the first one we're going to look at was shot at 15 millimeters at f2.8. And you can see that there is quite a shallow depth of field where just a little bit of the rock is in focus, but also notice the distortion in the background of the image as well. You can fix this in Lightroom and Photoshop, but it will affect the image quite significantly. So that's just something to bear in mind if you are zoomed all the way out at 15 millimeters. When you compare this to F11, you can see that there is a lot more in focus and it's all tack sharp, except when you get to the corners. If you zoom in here to the bottom right corner, you can see that there is quite a bit of distortion going on and it does get a bit soft. Some of this is because I am at F11 and some of it is because of the lens as well from other reviews that I've seen. So it is just something to bear in mind. When we go to the next image I've got here at 20 millimeters, also at F2.8, you can see there isn't as much distortion in the corners anymore. It's reduced quite significantly instead. And the depth of field is the same as when I shot at 15 millimeters where there's not a lot in focus. But when we take a look at the F11 image, you can see there's no distortion in the corners anymore and there is a lot more in focus. And if you do zoom in and scroll around a little bit, everything is very sharp. And that's one thing I really do enjoy about using this lens on the past week I've had it. So why do I think about this lens now that I've had the chance to take it out and play with it? I love the damn thing. I really do. And there's a few very good reasons for it that I'll go over, but there's also a few caveats and a few things to bear in mind that I should let you know about if you are considering a similar lens. One amazing thing about this lens that I had no idea about it at the time I got it is they claim it has five stops of image stabilization, which for a lens, is almost unheard of. Five stops in your camera body, I can completely understand, but five stops in a lens, I was very surprised. And I was actually able to verify it. I tried a picture at one second, handheld with stabilization on, and it was tack sharp. I don't know how they've done that in a lens, but they have, and I can verify, five seconds is correct. So bear that in mind. If you do need to do very slow handheld exposures with this one and you're at 15 millimeters, you can do up to a second with it. And one great thing about this lens over its little brother is the fact that it's f2.8. So when I'm doing my night photography and I want to do star trails and whatnot, I can open one full stop wider at f2.8 versus f4, which means I can bring my ISO down or I can extend my shutter speed to get more star trails in the one image, 
which makes my whole life a lot easier when I want to do that style of photography because I get that extra stop of light in there, which I wouldn't have if I got the F4. So that's one great thing about this lens is that it's F2.8 versus F4, which does make it much more versatile to use depending on the type of photography that you're doing. And the best thing about this lens that I like the most, the focal range. Because it's 15 millimeters at its widest, I can now chase pictures I've been trying to get for years, which I wasn't able to do properly with my 24 to 105. The 24 to 105 is great as a starting lens. It's great as a very versatile lens to cover a full, a, a large focal range because it can get relatively wide, but also zoom in quite a bit at 100. But the prime example, the number of times I've gone to try and get that picture of the upper house and the harbor bridge in the one frame, and I'm unable to because 24 is just too narrow, I took this down and I shot it at 20 millimeters. I got the image I've been chasing for years. And the best part is I've actually got a happy customer with it as well. And because of this lens, I was now able to get it in one shot without worrying about panorama, stitching it, layering it in Photoshop, none of that. I set the camera up on the tripod. I zoomed out to 20 millimeters because that was the perfect focal range for the image I was after. And I got the picture I want. I mean, in saying all that though, I can't just praise this lens and not let you know of the pitfalls about it even though it is going to serve my needs much better and I can get a lot more pictures with it now that I couldn't before. And the biggest one is that distortion when you're wide open at 15 millimeters. You can fix it in Photoshop and Lightroom, but there is gonna be some significant cropping to your image afterwards if you do try to straighten it out. So that is something to bear in mind. But also if you remember that picture at 15 millimeters and f2.8 and the distortion in the corners that I mentioned, be prepared to crop if you don't want that distortion and softness in the corners or zoom in to reduce it. Those are your two options, unfortunately, because when you're that wide open at both the focal range and the aperture, that is going to happen. I'm not sure if it's across all lenses that that's a common trait or if it's just this lens in particular, but it does happen with this lens. So just do bear that in mind. And the last thing to bear in mind, especially in comparison to this one's F4 counterpart, is this price and the weight. This retails for about $3,500, $3,600 Australian dollars. The F4 counterpart ranges anywhere from 2005 to 2008, depending if there's a sale on or which, short, which store you go to. I'll put the specs up here for both the F4 and the F2.8 so you can see the size, the weight, and the price difference. So that's something that you will have to decide whether going F2.8 is worthwhile or not. Because I was able to get this at a really good price, that is why I went with the F2.8 over the F4, because that way when I want to do my night photography with star trails, I don't have to bump up my eyes. So if I want to try and catch the Milky Way, which is nigh impossible in Sydney because of all the light pollution. But at the same time, I also am aware that I have to carry around an extra three or 400 grams compared to the F4 model. So it's a price I'm willing to pay because of what I am able to get out of this because of the fact it's F2.8 and it's a 15 to 35. Although the F4 is 14 to 35 as well. so. That's my initial impressions of this lens after using it a few times now and going out and taking photos with it. If you do have any questions about this lens specifically, let me know in the comments below and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. If you have liked this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up. That would be greatly appreciated. And if you do want to see me take this lens out to Bradley's head and chase sunsets for the first time in about five months, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and tick that little bell so you get a notification when that video comes out because that's exactly what we're doing next week. I'll leave it there for today. I hope you have enjoyed this video and I'll see you on the next one. Have a good night.